All right, I'm gonna make this uh, video, and uh, this video isn't to make anybody mad or start any kind of uh, controversy out there. I was just asked a question, and I thought I would share a little bit of the knowledge that I have on these few topics. And uh, one of the most asked questions that I get is cam break in. And a lot of people notice that when I start my engines, um, you know, I don't rev them up, you know, for 30 minutes at 2,500 RPM to break the cam in. The premise behind that is to get splash up on the cam, you know. They want plenty of oil up there while the lifters and cam are doing their thing to uh, mate together. And uh, unfortunately, I've had the... Ex the... Uh, pleasure of building motors every once in a while you fire them up on the floor and for one reason or another you're not happy with it and you end up taking the motor back apart and uh this happened to me uh once last year i built a motor and uh it ran not the way i like my motors to run didn't sound really good i couldn't get it to come around so i ended up taking the motor back apart and uh I thought it was pretty interesting, other than a race motor that you might run for a couple passes, you know, and you have very little miles on. This was a motor that was fired up and uh, ran for a little bit in the shop. Probably had a total of probably maybe 15 minutes, 20 minutes run time on it total. And uh, when I took it apart, the cam was broken. And uh, predominantly when I'm building engines, I try to steer towards a single spring unless it's a real high performance application, you know, then we'll go with a double spring. But we always set the installed height and we get the proper, you know, retainer and spring and the right combination of stuff to work together. All that's pretty important. However, oil is important too. And uh, I always use break-in oil, always. Uh, didn't used to back in the old days. I mean, you used to use Castrol 2050 at the shop I worked at for 15 years. And uh, we did nothing but air-cooled Volkswagen motors. And we never lost a camshaft. For uh, 20 years I worked there. I don't think we ever had a cam problem. And there was a short period of time where there was a cam issue. You know, there was a Rockwell problem with the lifters or the cam or a combination of both. And... Uh, you know, we thought that was the issue, uh, but nobody told us they were slowly taking the zinc out of the oil, and they did that. You'll see this, this zinc, or ZDP, there's a couple terms people use, phosphate, and what it is is when you have a solid lifter cam, you really, you know, the idea is you wanna have a cushion of oil between the lifter and the camshaft, and the, the two metals should never come into contact with each other. Is the premise under that, but we know that they both rub together. Uh, later model cars use a, a roller lifter, which has a tool steel cam, and you can't wipe it out. You can take these out, you can move them around on the cam, and nothing will ever go wrong. Uh, these are pretty reliable. There's needle bearings in here that can fail. Sometimes there's a bushing in here that can fail. Uh, this wheel will fail sometimes and you know it'll wipe the cam out that way but pretty much the rollers is the way to go you don't have to have any zinc additive in the car you need no high pressure lube for this to live and you can take all those additives out and you don't have the pollution issue or to deal with it contaminating the catalytic converter and that's why they took the zinc out now the first guys to notice the uh lifter problem were the mg guys if you guys read motor magazines. Some of the pr predominantly famous engine builders for MGs were starting to have lifter failure, which they had never had before. And uh, come to find out it was the oil. Now companies have made oils that are high in zinc. You always want to look for that. If you have a flat tappet cam, you have to be concerned with the oil you run. If you run a Rotella or a 2050 Castrol, you're going to lose your camshaft. And if you uh, rely on something like this, an additive, this is not going to work out for you. This, I've never seen this work out. Okay, I know they sell it. I have a bottle of it here, but it's brand new. It's never been opened. And uh, I don't recommend adding the break-in fluid to the oil. I recommend getting the proper oil. Uh, HPL is a good company. Driven. Uh, Lucas, 
you can pick your poison when it comes to oil. Uh, depending on your bearing clearance, you're going to have to pick your oil that you want, your viscosity, your weight. All that's determined by how much clearance you have between your crank and your bearing. Uh, the other thing we're going to talk about is how to put the lube on the camshaft, okay? <clears throat> when you buy a camshaft from a Volkswagen manufacturer, or any manufacturer for that point. Now I'll tell you, cam lube has changed over the years. When I was a uh, young lad many years ago, working at machine shops and working at scooter shop, which is an air-cooled Volkswagen shop again. And you have to remember now, an air-cooled Volkswagen, they're all solid cam motors. There is no hydraulic cams and there's no roller cams. So everything we deal with is a flat tappet, okay? And I've been building motors on YouTube for 10 years now and you've never seen me wipe a camshaft out ever. So I'll probably wipe one out on the next motor now. But anyway, let's talk about cam lube a little bit. <clears throat> now, back in the old days, you could get in trouble with cam lube because what people would do is they would, <clears throat> they would pop the old cam out here and they'd take it out of the bag. And they'd be like, okay, man, I got my cam, my new cam. And I'm gonna lube it up. And they put that stuff on the journals, they put it on the lobes, they just put it everywhere. You know, they rub it on the bearings. Well, back in the old days, cam lube had an abrasive in it. It was actually abrasive. It had a break-in abrasive to make the lifter to the lobe quicker. And they had to take that out because people kept putting it on the bearing surfaces. So now it's a little bit different. There's no abrasive in here. It's just a high-pressure grease. But this needs to be applied to the uh, cam lobes. You can see I just opened this cam, took it out of the bag, and it has a fresh tube of driven this is the uh, brand i just referred to as the motor oil driven joe gibbs racing this is designed to go on your camshaft and lifters now when you open that up we're going to use this one that's open you put some of this on your finger you make sure this cam's clean and you apply it to the lobe of the cam where the lifter is going to ride not the bearing surface but just to this lobe okay every lobe gets lubed up and then you take your lifter and you want to take some lube and you want to put it on your lifter this stuff's super sticky you can see how it it doesn't wipe off it's made to stick on your part initial fire up so these parts don't collide initially and they can gently mate together okay and that's why it's important to have that oil splash the 2500 to 3000 rpms for 30 minutes now what i found in the past is you know you don't always have the carburetors perfect the timing's not always set perfect so i don't like doing that 2500 rpm for 30 minute thing so i put extra oil in the motor so it's splashing around in there so if the motor holds three quarts i'll put four and a half in it and then, of course, after the break-in period, you know, I correct the oil level, take the break-in oil out, and put some normal oil in it. And by normal, I mean a high-performance oil that's made for a flat tappet camshaft. And I know you're driving a Volkswagen and you're saying, do I really need high-performance oil? Well, now you do because there's no zinc in regular motor oil because of the catalytic converter situation. And because the new cars have a roller lifter, which don't require any kind of pressure additive in the oil no zinc is required so this is how we apply the lube you never want to you know open this zinc up and pour it on your cam uh that ain't gonna work that's not gonna work if you have a double spring it's a real pain a real pain i know i have boxes of springs for american cars i don't just work on volkswagens i work on a lot of different stuff let me show you here what we got here so. we got boxes of these bad boys because a lot of times we'll have to adjust the spring pressures too high but these are damper springs and a lot of times these will have to be removed you know if you check the spring pressure that's another thing you want to make sure that you have the right spring pressure on a flat tap of cam. Too much spring pressure, it's going to wipe the cam out. Not enough, it's going to wipe the cam out. You're going to have valve float over the top of the lifter or the cam. 
So you want to measure your spring height. You want to make sure you have the correct pressure. That's, that's really important to match the springs to the cam that you're using. You want to use the right oil. A break-in oil is always a good idea. Lucas or Ams oil is what I like to use for break-in. And then you, know, you want to properly put your lube on your camshaft. One other thing you can do here to uh, make your chances a little better. It's one thing that I do. I don't think you have to do this. It's just something that I personally do. This is another cam that's prepped already, ready to go into a motor. It's brand new though. So what I do is all these sharp edges, I'll take a die grinder and I come in here with a sanding disc and I'll smooth all the edges off. A lot of times these edges are very sharp when you pull the cam out of the box. And you can see there where the, you know, where it's shiny right on the, the edge. Basically, I just radius that down a little bit so we don't have any sharp edges where the lifter's coming into contact with it and, you know, causing a, uh, you know, where there's a sharp piece of metal coming in contact with the lifter. Now, I know a lot of you guys are like, man, this guy's just, you know, full of it. And this is just a little bit of lifters from last year. Here's, a, here's some lifters from motors last year that I took out of motors. And there's not one wiped out lifter in this box. You just don't see it. You know, it's not a, uh, it's not a quality problem. It's a, a oil issue, more than likely, or too much spring pressure or not enough spring pressure. If you're running a single spring, you can almost never have a, a you know, an issue. This is a lube lifter here. You can see it's got a hole in the middle. They tried all different kinds of stuff to uh, keep the uh, cams from wiping out. Well, when everybody figured out it was the oil, you know, magically this uh, problem's gone away. And uh, I have really good luck with the uh, scat cams and the web cams. They're my favorites. You know, I don't ever have a problem with those. And I put a lot of them in, and it seemed to never have an issue. So, uh, you know, it's real important to put the lube on. Just put it on the lobes, not on the bearing surfaces. This stuff's really tacky and really draggy. So if you put it on your bearings, you know, it makes your motor turn over funny. And this is another reason why I always say you want the motor to fire right up. A lot of times, you know, I'm guilty of it. I'll put the distributor in backwards, or I'll do something stupid, and you got to crank the motor a lot of times. Well, the more you have to crank the motor before it does the initial fire up, this stuff's getting wiped off. You know, that's the that's why it's so slippery and tacky though. Uh, the idea is that this sticks on here until the motor fires up on your initial break-in. Obviously, there's not some little guy every time you fire your motor up crawling in here putting break-in lube on your camshaft. So, you know, at, at one point in time, it either lives or it doesn't. So, they tend to live though. I, I, I don't have any problems with... Uh, camshaft you know braking or whatever that it's not it doesn't seem to be a Volkswagen problem anymore uh, if you're gonna get some performance heads and you go to CV performance you tell them what camshaft you're running and they're really good about setting the spring pressure up and uh, of course you want to double check all that you know and uh, every cam manufacturer has a different requirement for the spring pressure the other thing I had a question on was a case sealer. And I just say talking about this because everybody, you know, has their favorite thing they use. Uh, I've been watching YouTube for quite some time. There's a couple channels that do some pretty good tests on YouTube. One of them is Project Farm. Uh, he does a lot of oil tests and a lot of different weird stuff, you know, and he tested silicone a couple weeks ago. He didn't use the Yamavon, but he used some Honda Bond. And it, it was pretty good, and the Mopar sealer was pretty good. And uh, there were some sealers that just weren't good at all. It was a pretty good video. You guys go over there and check that out. You can make your own opinion on sealer. Uh, Yama Bond is what I use on my transmissions. And, uh, well, the race stuff. And this stuff won't leak. You can break the transmission, and the side plates ain't coming loose unless it's really catastrophic. This stuff is amazing. Uh, it's not that expensive. It is, you know, fourteen dollars for a tube, so it's it's not like normal silicone, but it's it's good stuff. And the Mopar stuff looked really good in the test. Uh, Aviation Permatex 
is the old standard. I mean, I was taught how to build Volkswagen motors back in the 70s, and this is what we use. Uh, the guy I worked for would never use silicone on a motor, and eventually we uh, used it. Uh, I might have been the first one to goof it on my motor and not have an oil leak, you know, and then lo and behold, we started using it. But they've changed this stuff. It's not like it used to be. And uh, this stuff will fail, and it'll, your motor will leak. I can guarantee you that. Uh, I know there's a lot of guys that swear by it, but this stuff gets very brittle now. It doesn't stay pliable anymore, and once it gets brittle, it falls out of the case half. They start shuffling, and then you got an oil leak. The other stuff that people wanted me to try was the anaerobic sealer, and I tried that, and it's the same thing as this. It gets very brittle, and uh, it doesn't stay uh, pliable, and uh, I didn't really care for that. I mean, I don't have a big oil leak problem, so I like the silicone. You know, you need to limit the amount. Obviously, small B is all you need. Uh, I don't seal the bolts in the cylinder heads either, like a lot of guys do waste of time very little bit of oil is going to drip down those studs uh, the oil level would have to get quite high up there to get to the studs for one thing so you don't need to have silicone camping out up there and if you're going to seal under there use the aviation permatex you know uh, i use the permatex on the o-rings in the case and then i use the uh, silicone on the perimeter to get a good seal i also use the permatex on the oil pump I don't use the silicone on the oil pump. So it's just a matter of, it's not that this product isn't usable anymore, it's just if you depend on this to keep your case from leaking, you're not gonna be happy with the results. So I think we covered the lube. Uh, not all lubes the same. A lot of guys, you know, you know, like, hey man, I got Molly. Molly's the same, Molly's the same. This, this is black Molly grease. I wouldn't assemble a motor with this, you know, this is like for wheel bearings, you know, stuff around the shop, but this probably doesn't belong in a motor. Just like this is Molly, but it's for fasteners, you know, you wouldn't want to assemble an engine, it's fastener assembly grease. So they make different products for different things, and you have to watch where you put different stuff, and you want to be sure that, you know, you put those, follow the manufacturer's procedure. And if you don't follow the manufacturer's procedure, you probably don't want to badmouth the manufacturer because these cam manufacturers go through a lot of trouble to make sure that their product doesn't fail. A lot more than you think. Like a lot of guys talk about there's no quality control or this and that. And the quality control is better than it's ever been. They have machines that measure Rockwell hardness and all kinds of cool stuff. And especially companies like comp cams these guys aren't idiots man these are smart people uh i remember taking some classes at comp cams from scooter brothers and the guy was just so intelligent about anything to do with an engine and a lot of the guys there have the same passion they've been working on motors for a long time they don't have a revolving door either they have a lot of employees that have worked there for a long time just like webcam just like scat uh you know, a lot of these companies take a lot of pride in the products they put out, and I don't think they want to sell you something that they know is going to wipe out. That's just not the case. Follow the instructions, obviously, and uh, use the right motor oil, and I think, you know, you'll have a lot better luck. And then the spring pressure, that's the most critical part. So a little tricky stuff, you know, we're building this motor, and you can't run a roller cam in this Volkswagen class. You have to run... Uh, you know, they want you to run a flat tap it camshaft and uh, a roller cam will always make more power because this, this roller follows the profile. You can have a steeper, more aggressive ramp with a roller. And, you know, I've been beating this around. I got some people helping me with my motor that are a lot smarter than I am. And uh, this old time NASCAR guy he works at this lifter place and he gave me a he gave me an idea of something they used to do in NASCAR. You know, they're not allowed to use the roller cams either, or they didn't used to be able to. So what they used to do was they would use a ball bearing lifter. Look at that sucker. So uh, it's much lighter than a roller. You can put the uh, push rod wherever you want it here. You know, I just got to mark it up for him, assemble the engine, and he'll put the cup wherever I need it. But yeah, man. Woo! So uh, you get the benefit of a roller cam without the roller lifter. And uh, 
I don't know. It's supposed to work. We'll see. Experimental stuff. So uh, that's that. That's a little bit about that stuff. Somebody wanted me to do a quick walk through the shop and uh, look at the uh, car that I bought. I've been working on it. I had a couple people uh, offer some parts for this car. And uh, I'm on a really low budget. So, you know, unless you guys want to give me a good deal on some stuff, I'm sort of uh, broke at the moment. And uh, I don't see that situation changing anytime soon, but the car's coming along quite well. I got the uh, rockers all in. I got most of the bodywork finished on it. I got the sunroof opening and closing. I got all the glass out of it. Uh, most all the holes are patched. Now I got a little bit of work to do back in the back area. I got that big nasty hole that was there fixed. Uh, welded in the uh, bottom of the quarter over on this side. That's all finished up. Looks really good. And then working on these uh, door edges here, you know, put the lower pieces in and where you cramp them, you know, it's a little bit to get that to look really nice. But uh, yeah, man, if you guys have any used parts you want to sell or, you know, stuff you're not using, if you want to list what you have down below and what you want for it, you know, I'd be interested in at least entertaining it. You know, I need, do need some seats. Somebody asked me about seats. And I do need some seats and really I need everything. I don't really have a whole lot for this car. Uh, I'm going to take most of the pieces I had off this car, my old race car, because I'm chopping that off in the front and putting the motor up front now. And I'm not going to put the motor in the back anymore on this one. So I'm going to be able to use the beam, the brakes, uh, the rear spring plates, uh, the spring plate retainers, uh, you know, all that trick stuff that was on this pan car I can put on my street car. It's not all, you know, brand new stuff, but it's all decent stuff. It's some Ron Luma stuff, but it's older. And uh, I think it'll be okay. Here's the uh, Baja project. I had to uh, cut the bulkhead off of this. I welded a ball joint bulkhead on here and rebuilt this beam for them. So I got that put all together. We got some new ball joints in there, all new brakes. I painted the backing plates, you know, painted everything really nice. Uh... We went with the regular brakes set up because of all the expense, you know, that he had changing this over. He couldn't find anybody to do his kingpins, his spindles. So uh, he decided to go the ball joint route. And I just cut the old uh, bulkhead off, welded a ball joint bulkhead on here. Made some brake lines up so they're real clean now. Uh, got new tie rods for it, new steering dampener, new shocks. That's a used steering box, just cleaned it up. And uh, here's his old brake lines. I couldn't use that stuff. It's everything I got to put back on this car is just not, you know, you have to clean it, blast it, and buy new bolts. It's just been a real pain. The other pain that I ran into is this front bumper uh, used to attach to the uh, kingpin beam. So I have to make some mounts off the uh, top here. So I don't know if I can incorporate them into the. Uh, upper shock mount i don't think that would be very safe so i'm more than likely going to have to repaint those towers you know and weld some brackets on those for the top mounts here and uh yeah it's like these headlights are pretty nasty but all that's going to be underneath the front end our bonnet wherever you're watching from but uh yes yeah, what's going on with this to get the glass in it got all the pieces i just need to get on this thing and start working on it and then, of course, you know, the more you do, the more it costs. So we're trying to uh, do the things that he doesn't want to do and then leave the things that he thinks he can do. This job's gotten way out of hand. It came in for floorboards or floor pans and a scuff and shoot. And uh, we're, we've ended up going through this whole thing. So they always snowball. The other thing, I got the Nova back in the shop. I've really been abusing this car. i got to get back on this thing. And uh, it sat outside for a while, so the bottom of it's got, you know, mold on it and uh, needs to be jacked up, cleaned up, and de-dusted and repainted. Got some door hinges for it, stuff that I couldn't afford for, you know, I did what I could and ran out of money and, you know, just never finished the car. But I need to put the uh, fender wells in here, finish this thing up, and I'd really like to drive it. And uh, I don't know, I have some fantasy about doing some sort of uh, drive and drag event, but you can't ever get into those. I know a couple of guys I watched managed to uh, do them, and uh, it's awesome. 
just an awesome experience. I thought about just, uh, you know, tagging along even though I couldn't race, but uh, there's a few, few uh, cool YouTube races now that they have annually they're planning on doing out in the Midwest, and maybe I'll make it to one of those. But uh, yeah, I'd like to finish this car up and, uh, you know, at least have some fun with it again. But uh, it's sort of another stalled project. I got a couple things to sell, the bus and a Mustang and a four wheel drive truck out there. And that will get stuff moving again. I did get the uh, back and epoxy too. I don't know if uh, you've seen it since then. So this thing's coming along. It's really solid now. Somewhere in between Kmart and Sears. You know, when I was a kid, they used to say solid is Sears, but no, that's not so solid anymore. But uh, yeah, we gotta finish up the rear apron on this. And uh, I have to do a pan. I had the uh, pan outside there and we need to finish that up. And uh, well, I got it cut apart. I need to get started, weld the bulkhead on it and weld the pans to it and then build the suspension and stuff. So, all right, I'm gonna go ahead and shut this off. I'm yakking, rambling around. And uh, I did get some stuff vapor blasted today. You guys are gonna puke in this video. It's like old times, man. It's a really good video. Anyway, I gotta take it and have it polished, but I uh, vapor blasted the crankshaft, taped up the journals, blasted the gear, gears, the hub and the spacer. And uh, I'll get the heads blasted tomorrow. And uh, my fan and my uh, pickup, oil pickup, and a few other pieces for the Type 4. I'll get all that stuff bagged up. And it'll be a couple weeks before we get any more parts for that. But I am going to go ahead and throw the uh, cylinder head video up. It'll also be a couple more weeks before I get the valve guides. But uh, I did make a video of pulling those heads apart. And I'll put that up. I'm going to try to do the full series on this Type 4 build. And... Uh, don't know if we're going to go with the original fuel injection or an aftermarket fuel injection setup on this or we're going to go with carburetors. Still up in there on that, so we haven't made a camshaft, camshaft choice yet. But uh, it'll either be a webcam or a scat cam. Don't know yet. Uh, I prefer the webcam, obviously, but I hear there's some issue with web right now and availability, so we'll have to see. But that's what's going on with that. Two weeks out on the parts, but I want to get as much of it clean. That's usually my process. I'll get everything cleaned, bagged up, and then when the parts come in, I can just go ahead and do my assembly. So we know the crank measure is good. We'll measure it one more time when it comes back from the polish, but it should be within specs. Basically, they're just cleaning up the old oil lines and stuff like that and getting some of the scratches out of it, not really taking any size off of it. But, uh, yeah. All right. Thanks for watching, and I will see you on the next one.